Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Josh Redstone, and I'm back with another video lecture for Philosophy 2501A. And today I'm doing kind of a one-off special topics lecture on dreams and consciousness. This is one of the topics that I would have liked to have covered in one of our uh, sort of uh, student's choice special topics lectures that I had planned for our in-person lectures, but of course with the present situation, um, I've had to move everything online. So here's what I've decided to talk about. Uh, dreams, consciousness, in particular what we can learn about consciousness by studying dreams. Um, now, um, just right off the bat, most of what I'm going to be saying today will actually be drawn from sources other than our course textbook. Uh, Blackmore does discuss dreams and dreaming in her textbook. Um, so if you want to go ahead and read those sections, if you're writing your essay on dreams and dreaming and consciousness, um, go ahead, definitely take a look at those. Um, but I'm just going to be um, uh, I'm just going to be riffing on some things today. Um, nonetheless, I will make some other readings that you might find interesting available in the information section. Uh, or video description section for this video. They're not going to be required for the final exam, but you may find them interesting and they may be helpful if you've decided to write your essay on this topic. <clears throat> okay, so, um, well, dreams, I think, are a really great example of an interesting mental phenomenon that um, used to be considered quite mysterious, um, but that we can now study very well with the tools of cognitive science. Um, and by studying dreams this way, I think that we might be able to clarify um, some of the differences between consciousness uh, and unconsciousness, so conscious states and unconscious states. Um, we might be able to do other interesting things, uh, empirical things, for example, by understanding how dreams are realized in the brain. So in other words, what the dreaming brain is like, and by comparing that to the waking brain, we might learn a little bit more about the neural correlates of consciousness. For example, if you recall from my previous lecture on the neural correlates of consciousness, I talked about how area V1, uh, an area in the primary visual cortex, is not implicated in phenomenal visual experience. And the interesting thing is that when we dream, we have visual experiences, um, but area V1 is not active when we dream. So it seems to be the case that uh, whether we're talking about waking conscious states or uh, dream, dream states, visual experiences during dreams, um, it seems to be uh, brain areas that are sort of not quite lower level, but not quite absolute high level, if, if there is a higher level. Um, it seems to be that the phenomenal stuff that we're interested, uh, interested in occurs um, higher up, but not all the way at the top of the information processing hierarchy. So perhaps by studying dreams we can learn more about this kind of thing. Um, I mentioned earlier how we might be able to clarify our understanding of sleeping, waking, conscious, unconsciousness, uh, different states that fall along those different spectrums. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of discussion like that today, uh, which should be fun. Um, and I want to say also that, um, you know, studying dreams and dreamings, uh, dreams and dreaming, uh, was one of the things that really got me interested in the mind. So this is kind of like, um, I don't know, this is, one of the, this is one of the areas that I've supposed been interested in the longest. Dreams and what the dreaming brain or the dreaming mind is doing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I started learning about that stuff when I was younger, probably, uh, you know, when I was just starting high school, in fact. Um, and I noticed that there was a lot of bunk out there. Um, what I really wanted to know was a bit about the science uh, but there's a lot of bunk, a lot of new age kind of, you know, hippy-dippy stuff about dreams. Uh, that's fine if you're into that, but that's not really what I'm interested in. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, you know, I think there's an interesting, uh, there's, there's interesting things to be discussed here. And they're interesting, uh, they're interesting enough without having to, um, make them seem kind of spooky or mysterious or flim-flammy uh, when it comes to dreams and the dreaming brain. So anyway, um, so that's it for my preface for, for today's lecture. Let's get into it by talking a little bit about what dreams are and how they come to occur. I should mention before I get started that um, 
I did a lecture very much like this for a previous class a few years ago. Um, and a few of the answers I provided then were, um, you know, just the kinds of things you could find in a dictionary, right? In fact, Google Dictionary defines a dream as a series of thoughts, images, sensations, um, and, sorry, and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep. Uh, similarly, Wikipedia defies a dream, or defines a dream as a succession of images, ideas, emotions, and sensations that usually occur involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. And it's true that most other technical definitions of dreams agree with these uh, more, I guess, everyday definitions. So dreams are um, ostensive experiences um, that occur in someone's mind, I guess we could say, offline during sleep. I say offline because the brain seems to be generating these experiences, but it's not getting any of the information it needs to do that from the external world. You know, your sensory systems are, are, are offline. Uh, so we say that these experiences come to be offline as well, rather than online like our waking experiences. Um, of course, most dreams occur during REM sleep. Now, REM stands for rapid eye movement. And of course, REM sleep is characterized by these rapid eye movements um, together with paralysis of most of the muscles in the body. So when we're dreaming, when we're in the stage of sleep during which dreams occur, which is REM sleep, um, the eyes move about. Uh, and as we'll see, these eye movements probably correspond to where one is looking during the dream. So when they're looking around a dream scene, these eye movements seem to um, these eye movements seem to correspond with that, at least in certain circumstances, which is very interesting. Um, the heart, and the lungs, and the eyes uh, then are not paralyzed during REM sleep, but the rest of the body is paralyzed during REM sleep. And of course, this way we don't get up and act out our dreams. Um, and of course, when we when we take a look at the uh, neural activity. Uh, of a dreaming brain, and this is usually done in a sleep lab with an EEG or an electroencephalogram, uh, which uh, which has lots of different electrodes sitting on top of the scalp, and they detect um, changes in electrical potential at the scalp that are generated by groups of neurons. When we examine somebody dreaming with an EEG like this, we find similar kinds of activity in the brain as we do uh, when we examine people who are awake. Um, now, uh, this is interesting because um, a lot of people think of things like sleepwalking or somnambulism, as it's called, um, as cases of people um, getting up and acting out their dreams. Uh, interestingly, somnambulism occurs during non-REM sleep. So somnambulism, uh, sleepwalking, and, and also sleep talking don't typically occur during stages of sleep when we're dreaming. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. I've always thought that was very cool. Um, some people, I guess, have this idea that when we're sleepwalking, we're acting out our dreams. That is actually not the case. Um, but of course, there have been studies done on animals where uh, certain alterations are made to their brain uh, that inhibits this uh, paralysis um, that occurs of the muscles in the body during REM sleep. And these animals will get up and walk around um, during REM sleep. Um, I'll link a video in the video description of this kind of thing um, so that you can see it for yourself. But in most cases of sleepwalking, we are not actually dreaming when we're sleepwalking or even sleep talking for that matter. So um, I'm going to put a little uh, visual aid up here um, highlighting the stages of sleep. Uh, the stages of sleep are really interesting. Um, we'll go um, through deeper and deeper stages of sleep in, in each cycle of sleep or sleep cycle. So um, we'll be awake, we'll pass very briefly through REM sleep when we first fall asleep, and then we'll go deeper and deeper from stage one to stage four, which is deep sleep or slow wave sleep. It's called slow wave sleep because the brain waves that show up on our EEG recordings when we do this are slow and steady uh, when we look at them, you know, when we, when we graph them out and look at them that way. Um, 
And then of course, as the night progresses, we come back up into a more shallow kind of sleep and that's where REM sleep occurs. Um, uh, and these cycles um, going into deep, deep sleep get shorter and the periods that we're in REM sleep actually get longer as the night goes on. So when you're first falling asleep, you might have a very, very brief dream and then fall into a very deep sleep and then you'll come back up for a short period of REM sleep, go back into deeper sleep, back up for a slightly longer period of REM sleep, and so on and so forth throughout the night. And you'll pass through four or five of these sleep cycles until um, it, before waking, an hour or two before waking, you can be dreaming for quite a long time. Now sometimes dreams do occur in non-REM sleep, uh, but these are much rarer. Um, and the dreams that are reported following waking from non-REM sleep are reported to be much less vivid. Um, they're also a lot harder to recall. So when we, when we awaken directly from REM sleep, uh, dreams can be fairly easy to recall, especially if we're practiced at doing so. But when we awaken from non-REM sleep and we've had a dream, it can be very difficult to recall. Um, that's because we're, we're usually pretty dopey when we awaken from such a deep sleep. And other mammals besides humans dream, too. Um, so you've probably seen, if you have a pet like a dog or a cat, you've probably seen your dog or cat dreaming, for example. Um, all right, so um, that's all I want to say for now about what dreams are. Um, let's talk about remembering your dreams and why this is hard to do. All right, so many people have this uh, idea that they don't dream, um, which is certainly not the case. Uh, everybody dreams, in fact. Uh, everybody dreams several times a night. Remember, um, REM sleep periods actually increase in length as the night goes on. So people dream at least four or five times a night, and each time they do, the time during which they dream gets longer. The fact is that most people simply don't remember their dreams. Um, in fact, it's better, or rather, you stand the best chance of remembering a dream if you've awakened directly from a dream. So if you're if you're awakened by an alarm clock immediately from REM sleep or something like that. Um, otherwise, if you slowly drift out of REM sleep and then you wake up, not directly from REM sleep, you will probably forget your dreams unless you are practiced at remembering them. But why is that? Why is it that dreams are difficult to remember? Um, especially since a lot of dreams are, are just so weird right? We dream about very strange things often, and you'd think that they, they would be especially memorable. But there's one possible explanation for why dream recall is difficult. Um, uh, this is from uh, Stephen Leberge, who is a psychophysiologist who studied the mind-body relationship during sleep. If you're interested, by the way, um, you can check out a couple of his books. Here I've got Lucid Dreaming, his first book, and Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming. Uh, by uh, Stephen Leverage and Howard Rheingold. Um, these are both about a specific type of dream called a lucid dream, which is a dream during which one knows they're dreaming. And we're going to talk more about that at the end of the lecture. Um, oh, and while, while I'm at it, um, in this great book by Susan Blackmore, there's a nice interview with Stephen Leverage. Um, very good, worth checking out for sure. Anyway, Stephen Leverage has this idea um, why dreams are difficult to recall. So he has um, has us imagine a cat. Okay, so we've got this cat. This cat lives next door to a vicious dog. Um, now, uh, the cat knows to avoid the dog every time the cat's out wandering around. Uh, being a cat in the yard, it can see the dog, but it stays well away from the dog, away from the danger of this vicious, vicious predator. Um, so, one day, the cat dreams that the dog has, say, run away or something. Well, what if the cat remembers its dream, wakes up thinking that the dog is not there, that, that this thing that's changed in the world is actually real? Well, the cat might venture over only to be eaten by the dog, who is, of course, still there. 
So perhaps it would be maladaptive to remember dreams because we might mistake them for reality. That's one possibility. Um, we might risk, uh, you know, this is to say that we might risk getting things wrong about the world that are critical to survival because we've remembered them from a dream. Um, but of course, if dreams are hard to remember, then no problem. Of course, this isn't a perfect explanation. I mean, we still do remember our dreams. And um, upon remembering them, uh, remembering that they were dreams, um, we, we tend to realize, oh, right, that was just a dream. Uh, so if we, if we forget about the cat example and talk about a human uh, remembering something strange in their dream happening, um, they could easily go and, and check whether this thing they've dreamed about has actually come to pass. Um, or it might be so weird and wacky that as soon as they remember it, they'll realize, oh, of course that was a dream because it was so strange. Um, so that's not a perfect explanation, but it's one explanation. Um, uh, but in any case, um, if LeBerge is right, uh, perhaps it's not always adaptive for the organism to remember its dreams. Um, so this is why organisms have a difficult time remembering their dreams. Perhaps there's no reason just to be able to remember our dreams, on the other hand, right? I mean, there are some accounts of dreams that say that dreams are a way of our brains to, dreams are like a way for our brains to um, process stuff from the day before. So dreams are just kind of like this weird epiphenomenon and um, there's no need to remember them, although sometimes we just happen to remember them. Um, so that's another explanation. But of course, People have been remembering their dreams for a long time, and most ancient accounts of dreaming place a great importance on dreams. In fact, a lot of ancient tradi traditions believe that dreams were actually divine in origin. So the ancient Greeks, for example, believed um, that uh, dreams came from Morpheus. So Morpheus, which means shaper of form, or just shaper, um, is the principal god of dreams in the Greek pantheon. And uh, there were also other little dream gods called Oniroi, um, and they presided over various aspects of dreaming. So dreams for the ancient Greeks were, at least initially, thought to be messages from gods. Other cultures have attributed uh, divine or prophetic importance to dreams as well. I mean, there are accounts of dreams in the Bible, for example, that prophets had. Um, uh, and of course, um, in Eastern traditions, dreams have been very important for understanding consciousness and the nature of reality. And indeed, the Tibetan Buddhists have a tradition of uh, dream yoga, or yoga of the dream state, where they practice lucid dreaming in order to understand uh, reality, uh, the mind, consciousness, uh, to achieve enlightenment, and all of that stuff. So dreams have been very important. Uh, throughout human culture, in all kinds of different human cultures. Um, modern accounts of dreaming really start to come together, at least modern sort of scientific or proto-scientific accounts of dreaming start to come together with Sigmund Freud. Uh, now, of course, Freud's view of dreaming is not, um, not the one accepted by scientists today, but Freud was one of the first thinkers to really systematically try and study dreams, and of course he had a psychoanalytic account of dreams. So Freud thought that dreams were expressions of uh, things that had been repressed. It's all about the return of the repressed for Freud. So we repress things like fears, desires, traumatic events, and those kinds of things. We repress them into the subconscious, um, but they return and uh, kind of show themselves in dreams. Along, along with uh, you know, various neuroses and disorders of the psyche that we might come to experience. So, of course, for Freud, um, the interpretation of dreams was actually an important part of psychoanalysis. He thought that you know, there were images and symbols in dreams that could be interpreted, and this might help him psychoanalyze a patient and hopefully you know, help, help that patient integrate these repressed elements of their psyche into the psyche and, and uh, not experience these uh, neuroses anymore. Of course, um, dreams, uh, nowadays nobody really, at least scientists, don't really think of dreams as um, unconscious messages or letters to yourself, as Stephen LaBerge calls them. 
um, uh, dreams are dreams are put together. Uh, rather, dreams come to occur for for very different reasons for uh, on our modern scientific understanding of them. So, going back to Stephen Leberge, for example, he's got a quite a different account of dreams and dreaming from from Freud. Um, so remember that during REM sleep, the brain is nearly as active as, as it is when we're awake. Um, and according to Leberge, the reason why that is is because the, the, the dreaming brain is doing the same thing that the waking brain is doing. It's building an experience of, of something. It's representing a world and it's representing a body, uh, an agent with a body in that world. Um, but of course, our sensory systems aren't, aren't working uh, when we're asleep. Uh, I mean, they are, I guess you could say. We can still be, we can still be awakened by um, a sudden noise um, or some kind of danger, right? But for the most part, um, unless we're already waking up, um, external stimuli don't really enter into our dreams. Um, so when we're awake, our brain is kind of building a model, a representation of the world, um, using information from the world. So it's, it's generating this experience based on sensory information that's coming in from what's actually out there. But when we're asleep, um, we don't receive this kind of information from the senses. The only information that the dreaming brain has to build this kind of experience is coming from what's already in the brain. Right? So in other words, um, we're talking about memories, emotions, uh, maybe things that have happened to us that day. And, you know, not to get all Freudian again, but perhaps things that we're thinking about, things we're preoccupied with, maybe desires, um, beliefs, and that kind of thing. This is what the dreaming brain uses to build an experience during REM sleep. So, um, you know, um, all of this is to say that... Um, we have these, uh, what, what a psychologist or a psychophysiologist like Leberge would call schemas, or what a philosopher or a cognitive scientist would call a concepts, you know, mental models of things that are um, kind of on the threshold of awareness once a dream begins. They could be leftover things that we've been thinking about or, or from the day or things we've experienced during the day. And the rest of the dream is generated thanks to associations between uh, these active concepts and other inactive concepts. So let's say I, I, I encountered a particularly uh, interesting situation during the day. Maybe I saw something weird. Maybe I saw a guy dressed up as a clown playing a saxophone. Just say. Stranger things have happened, right? So I think, oh, that's really weird, that's pretty memorable, that really stands out. And so maybe when I dream, I dream of this strange person dressed as a clown playing a saxophone. But then the rest of my dream is built upon concepts that are associated with that. You know, maybe, maybe it takes place within some kind of musical conservatory because of uh, an association between my saxophone concept, which is active, uh, activated by my memory of what I saw that day, and, um, and just my musical concepts more generally. Um, alternatively, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I dream about the circus simply, simply because of the association between the circus or my concepts of circus things um, and, and the memory of seeing somebody dressed like a clown, right? So um, according to Leberge, um, this is how dreams come to be built by... Um, or come to be generated by these schemas or concepts that are still kind of active when we begin dreaming. And the rest is a matter of association, memory, expectation, and that kind of thing. And this might help to explain why dreams are so weird and unpredictable, right? I mean, when we're awake, our representation of the world is pretty stable. And that's because the external world is stable. Right? I mean, we talked about ju this during some of our earliest lectures. Uh, when I asked if any of you could demonstrate whether you were in fact awake or not, um, how could you be sure that you were not having a dream of being in philosophy class rather than um, 
actually being there in philosophy class. Well, um, <coughs> when we're awake, our representation of the world is stable because the world itself is stable. You know, I could read, I could read the title of this book, Conversations on Consciousness, look away and look at it again, and it still says the same thing because there's a stable something out there in the world. Um, so the sensory information that I'm receiving and that I'm using to build this experience is also stable. But when we're dreaming, we're, it, dreams occur offline rather than online. So there's nothing stable upon which to build these representations out of. Which is why we can suddenly find ourselves dreaming about very strange things or find ourselves all of a sudden in a different location or or something, right? Maybe I open the door to my apartment to go outside and all of a sudden I'm in a completely different city. Um, obviously that couldn't happen if you were really awake, but if you were dreaming, um, it certainly could happen because the way the brain builds this experience is based on memory, expectation, association, and those kinds of things rather than what's actually out there in the world. And of course the prefrontal cortex, which as we know is important for reasoning and planning and executive function and those kinds of things, shows decreased activity during dreaming. So we're, we're less critical of the weird stuff that happens when we're dreaming. Um, I could dream that I'm in a circus with a clown playing a saxophone or I open the door to my apartment, which is located in Ottawa, and all of a sudden find myself in Toronto or on Mars or something, and I might not think anything of it, or if I did, I might think, oh, that's strange, um, I guess I've moved uh, to Toronto or Mars. Yeah, that's right, that's what happened, and I kind of rationalize it, right? It's because my critical faculties and the, the brain areas that underwrite those critical faculties are less active. Okay, so that's all I want to say uh, for now about how dreams are generated. I'll probably come back to this point a few times throughout the essay, or throughout essay, throughout the lecture. Um, but I want to talk now about whether dreams actually count as experiences. So philosopher Daniel Dennett has proposed this account of dreaming, um, which is pretty different from the one that we just discussed. Uh, which has kind of come to be known as the cassette theory of dreaming. And you can read about it in um, certainly the interview with Stephen LaBerge in this book, um, and also I believe in the interview with Dennett. Um, um, in any case, I'll try to link, um, I'll try to link the original paper uh, in which Dennett proposes this idea called the cassette theory of dreaming, um, or if you have access to his book Brainstorms, um, I believe it also features as a chapter in that book. Um, in any case, I'll, I'll do my best to provide the link for that information if you're interested. But on Dennett's account of dreaming, dreams are actually the result of these, quote, instantaneous memory insertions occurring at the moment of awakening. So let's break that down. Basically, without going into too much detail, uh, Dennett thinks there are two processes going on when we dream. One is a kind of composition process, and this is where uh, a dream narrative actually gets put together during REM sleep. But it's important to note that there's no actual experience going on for Dennett when this is happening, when this unconscious narrative is being put together, because it's unconscious, right? Then again, there's worries of, you know, the Cartesian theater and Cartesian materialism and all that here, which I'm sure Dennett would would be quick to point out, but nonetheless, uh, the other process is a memory insertion process, which is what underlies our recollection of the dream. So it's what, what results in our recalling having had an experience, even though the, this memory, or rather this uh, narrative process that comes to occur is unconscious for Dennett. So for that reason, Dennett does not think that dreams actually count as experiences. So we remember having an experience, but it's not because an experience, an, you know, an experience actually occurred uh, during sleep. Rather, the uh, experience is inserted, uh, or the memory of an experience is inserted, a bit like how we insert a cassette tape into a tape deck. I don't know if any of you remember cassettes. Um, 
but, uh, well, uh, visual aids, uh, cassette tape. You can think of uh, our recollection of the experience as the tape being inserted rather than, you know, an, an actual recording. You know, I, I guess a good way to put this is like, um, we have the tape, but we didn't record what was on the tape in REM sleep. The tape just gets popped in upon awakening, um, if I'm if I'm understanding Dennett correctly here. So, uh, a bit of an old analogy. Um, nonetheless, I think it's a good analogy for, for what De uh, Dennett's trying to say here. Now, um, the problem with this, and this is one of the few areas where I really part ways with Dennett. Um, you guys will know, I, uh, I, I, I think his theory of consciousness makes a lot of sense, and I think he's done a great job of... Um, helping us to bust some of those Cartesian intuitions that we all still have about consciousness. But there's actually empirical evidence to think that um, dreams are indeed experiences. Um, and to understand why um, and how we can, we, can, we can test which of these two accounts of dreaming is true, that is Leberge's account of unconscious, you know, concept activation and association between different concepts and building an experience versus Dennett's where dreams are not experiences at all could actually be tested experimentally. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't been explicitly tested experimentally, but the empirical evidence that we do have does seem to suggest that LeBerge's account is the correct one. Um, but to talk about this, to, to really tackle this question and talk about the evidence, we need to talk about a particular kind of dream, the earlier mentioned lucid dream. So let's get into that now and talk about lucid dreams. So we've mentioned lucid dreams in class before, so most of you will be familiar with the idea and probably a lot of you have actually had a lucid dream yourself. Uh, so a lucid dream is a dream during which you know you're dreaming. Now these are rare, um, unless one practices and, um, you know, maybe does some techniques to have them more often. They tend not to occur very often. But who knows, some individuals have them quite often. Some individuals seem to be able to have them at will. Uh, you know, they'll say to themselves, tonight I'm going to have a lucid dream, and they have one. Um, I'm kind of envious of those people who don't have to work at it because it's really fun to explore consciousness from within a dream. Um, but in any case, lucid dreams have been reported since antiquity. Nonetheless, for a long time, uh, a lot of scientists and philosophers thought it was impossible. You know, a lucid dream is a kind of contradiction in terms. Um, uh, you know, if we were lucid in our dreams, that would mean that we're conscious during our dreams. But dreams happen when we're asleep, and when we're asleep, we're unconscious. So it seems like a contradiction. We can't be conscious when we're unconscious. Um, didn't make any sense to a lot of people. Nonetheless, um, it's been demonstrated that these dreams really do take place. Um, and here's one of those areas where uh, I think Talking about dreams and dreaming can help us clarify what we mean by consciousness and unconsciousness. I mean, if we mean that we're conscious, if, or if consciousness is just being aware, awake and aware, um, then certainly when we're in non-REM sleep, we're, in, we're unconscious. But I don't think we're any less conscious during a regular dream than we are when we're awake, just going about our day-to-day -day business. I mean, when we're dreaming, we ignore or overlook lots of weird, wacky stuff that happens. But when we're awake, it's not like we're all walking around going, oh, look how awake and aware and conscious I am of everything that's going on. No, we don't do that at all. Um, not unless we're in the habit of it. Maybe if you're a philosopher or uh, someone who's practicing lucid dreaming. Um, so I don't think we're any more or less conscious when we're awake uh, than when we're dreaming. It's just that when we're dreaming, uh, these ostensive experiences that we're having are taking place offline, and when we're awake, our experiences are online. Uh, and certainly when we have a lucid dream, I think we're more aware 
um, than we are during a typical dream. And it might be comparable to, say, when you're awake but meditating or thinking about consciousness or doing a mindfulness exercise or something like that. So, um, yeah, I'm unconvinced by this old philosophical reasoning why lucid dreams are an impossibility. And in any case, that doesn't really matter anyway, because as I said, um, their existence has been demonstrated empirically. So let's take a look at some of these lines of evidence and learn about how people first identified or first um, uh, established that lucid dreams are in fact a real mental phenomenon. So lucid dreams were established to be an actual phenomena independently, that is by two different uh, research teams in uh, the late 70s and early 80s. Um, uh, on the one hand, you had Keith Hearn, uh, who is actually a parapsychologist um, working in the United Kingdom, and Stephen LaBerge, who I've already mentioned, who was working in the United States on his PhD thesis at the time. Now, um, each of them uh, were using participants who were already skilled at having lucid dreams. Uh, Heron was using um, a participant named Alan Worsley, um, uh, who uh, was skilled at having lucid dreams, and Stephen LaBerge um, would himself spend a lot of time in the sleep lab, together with other people who he called oneironauts, or explorers of the dream world. People who could learn to have lucid dreams and who could spend time in a sleep lab. Uh, so that we could study the mind-body relationship during uh, dreaming sleep. Now, both LaBerge and Keith Hearn knew that um, the eye movements that occurred during REM sleep tended to follow the gaze of dreamers. So um, this was actually discovered by chance when it was observed that um, on, on, a, on a polygraph that was measuring eye movements um, during sleep in a sleep lab, sleep lab sorry, it was observed that there were these uh, slow left to right saccades um, uh, on this person's eye movements. And when this person awakened from the dream, they asked them, what was going on there? What were you dreaming about? And apparently they reported um, that they had been dreaming about a game of ping pong and following the ping pong ball um, as it was hit back and forth across the ping pong table. So knowing that, they could arrange for their oneironauts to make these pre-established eye movements. So these eye movements were non-random. They were agreed upon by the experimenter and the participant before going to sleep. And they could use these as a signal from within the dream to tell the experimenter when they realized they were dreaming and when they were carrying out certain experiments during a dream. For example, counting, um, counting to 10 to measure the subjective passage of time is something that's been done in these kinds of experiments. So they could use these eye movements to signal the experimenter in the laboratory while they were asleep and dreaming. That's pretty cool. Um, it's almost like communicating from another world. Uh, very interesting. So um, this is how it was established that um, lucid dreaming uh, really took place. Um, these signals seem to occur in real time um, from the participants' dreams, and they were they were predetermined, you know, or, or, or agreed upon. Um, you know, when you're dreaming, participant uh, person signal um, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, or something like that, uh, so that they knew it wouldn't be due to chance. Um, and Stephen LaBerge, in particular, has used this kind of uh, method of study to investigate the mind-body relationship during sleep. So um, he studied the passage of time in, in dreams, for example, um, you know, by having people count to 10 or whatever. And what they found is that, um, although these measures are somewhat subjective, that time seems to pass at roughly the same rate uh, when we're dreaming as it does when we're awake. That is to say that our subjective sense of time is pretty much the same when we're awake uh, compared to when we're asleep. And of course this seems to suggest that since this is all happening in real time, as far as we can tell, that, um, uh, that LaBerge is right. These are, these are really experiences that our dreaming mind is generating, not 
uh, inserted uh, memories, you know, that are popped in like a cassette tape when we awake. Otherwise, it would be pretty hard to account for the um, the eye movement signal stuff that Stephen LeBerge and his colleagues have reported. Um, and also, this is a really interesting, at least for me, this is a really interesting example of how something can move from um, an you know, a not very legitimate realm of inquiry like parapsychology to a legitimate realm of inquiry like psychology or psychophysiology. I mean, um, and it's why we don't really have any more parapsychologists anymore, um, right? If there, if there were some things like, you know, um, telepathy or telekinesis or these other things that parapsychologists study, we would have found them, we would have identified them, we would have been able to study them by now. Um, it turned out that lucid dreams were in fact real. Um, and once that was established, um, they started to be studied by real psychologists and neuroscientists rather than parapsychologists. Blackmore herself um, started out as a parapsychologist um, uh, but quickly abandoned that field uh, when she realized it was kind of a fruitless path. Um, and she still writes about interesting things like altered states of consciousness and dreams, and which you can read about in our course textbook. But she does it from a psychological perspective and a cognitive science perspective, not a parapsychology perspective. Um, so this is a really cool example of that. You know, if there's something to be found, we'll find it and we'll study it properly. Uh, and that turned out to be the case with lucid dreams. It hasn't turned out to be the case with a lot of other, um, you know, so-called so paranormal phenomena. All right, um, so um, before we get to some really interesting stuff, um, you know, why is it that we dream? Um, well, um, I, I didn't talk about this right off the bat because really we don't have an answer to this question yet. Um, it could be that dreams are epiphenomena, so um, they don't serve a purpose. Um, it's just kind of something our brain does. Um, dreams might be important for testing new concepts. Um, so maybe dreams are our brain's way of simulating new concepts, testing them out. Um, it could be um, it could be our brains. Um, moving uh, information that they've encoded uh, from the day uh, into, say, long-term memory. So dreams might just be a result of those kinds of processes. Uh, dreams may ne not have any purpose at all. They might be like a spandrel, you know, something that our, our brains can do um, just because of the way that our brains have evolved, but they're not something our brains have actually evolved to do. Um, these are all possibilities. We're not sure yet. But before I go, um, I wanted to give you guys uh, uh, some information about how to actually have lucid dreams. So that if you wanted to explore consciousness using your own um, dreaming minds, um, you might have somewhere to start in order to do that. So let's take a look at that stuff now. All right, so say you want to learn how to have a lucid dream, uh, maybe just for fun or just to explore the differences between dreaming and wakefulness or to, uh, to learn about consciousness or uh, whatever. Um, there are certain things that you need to do um, in order to make that happen. Now, as I mentioned, um, some of you may just have one simply from watching this lecture or from hearing about it, right? Perhaps the idea of a lucid dream is one of those concepts that will remain active uh, so that um, it's, it's active when you begin dreaming and uh, that might cause you to become aware that you're dreaming. That's a possibility. Um, but if you're not one of those people that has a sort of natural, uh, you know, kind of knack for this sort of thing, there are a couple things that you can do. Firstly, you need to improve the recollection of your dreams. Um, there's a couple reasons why you need to do this. I mean, if you can't recall your dreams, then you can't make any progress towards having a lucid dream. And you may, in fact, already be having them. You may just not be remembering that you're having them. So it's important to recall your dreams. Um, to do this, you can keep a record 
of your dreams. Uh, you can you can write them down. You can um, you can type them up on your computer. You can voice record them, whatever works for you, but you want to keep a record of them. And be as detailed as you can. Try to, try to remember as best you can. Um, and you know, keep this, keep whatever you're using, whether it's like a journal or a file on your computer or um, on your cell phone, keep it handy because sometimes you wake up, you forget your dreams, and then when you're getting back into bed, you remember your dreams all of a sudden. Um, this happens to me sometimes. So. You want to keep a record of your dreams because you want to get better at remembering your dreams. Um, another reason you want to be able to get better at this is because you want to be able to identify what is particularly dreamlike about your dreams. Um, everybody's dreams are a little bit different, um, but there are certain things that tend to recur in everybody's dreams. Um, some of the weird things that uh, recur for me are like, um, like I have this one weird giant house that I always seem to dream about, and it's always within another building. It's very strange. It's hard to explain, but I'll be in my apartment, say, and open a door that uh, is in my dreams that I hadn't noticed before, and it opens up into this big giant room um, and it's always the same or very similar, whether I get into this apartment uh, by going into a house on the street or through a door that I've dreamed about in my apartment or something weird like that. It's, it's this weird dream house that I always or fairly often end up in. So that's one example. Um, I also often have dreams about weird, dirty bathrooms. Uh, I don't know what that's about, but um, in any case, you want to find these things that are dreamlike because you can use those as cues um, in order to make yourself realize that you're dreaming. Okay, um, so dream recall is important because you could be having lucid dreams and just not remembering them and you need to remember your dreams in order to notice what's dreamlike about them. You also need to make a habit of doing what's called reality testing or critical state testing, as uh, Stephen LaBerge and Paul Tholey and, and thinkers like that call it. Basically what this involves is getting into the habit of asking yourself several times a day whether you are in fact dreaming and testing whether or not you are dreaming. There's a bunch of ways that you can do this. Uh, you, can, you can do something like I suggested earlier and find a piece of text and try to read it. If you can read it, look away, and read it again, chances are you're awake uh, because that representation is being built on sensory information that comes from a stable external world. But that's not the case when you're dreaming. So reading text, reading digital clocks, um, even things like light switches will not work very well uh, when you're dreaming. So you can always easily test whether you're awake or asleep by trying to read something or by trying to activate a light switch. Another interesting one is um, taking your finger and pushing it through your hand. Um, obviously you can't do this when you're awake, but when you're asleep, you can try this if you happen to have a lucid dream, you'll be able to push your finger through your hand because there is no hand, right? It's like the matrix, there is no spoon, it's that kind of a thing. Um, another thing you can do is plug your nose and try to breathe through your nose. I can't do it right now because I'm awake, um, but if I were asleep, um, I would be able to continue breathing even though my nose was plugged because, you know, again, there is no nose. Um, and speaking of your hands, another way to do it is to simply look at your hands. Um, your representation of your hands when you're awake is again stable, but oftentimes people report that when they're dreaming, uh, their hands will look different. Uh, maybe they'll have extra fingers or something like that. So that's a good way to do it as well. And there are lots of other different ways um, that you can test your reality. But the idea is you either get into a habit of doing this several times throughout the day, say between 10 and 15 times throughout the day. The idea there is that if you get into a habit of asking yourself whether you're dreaming or awake when you're awake, eventually, that habit will carry over into dreams and you'll 
ask yourself whether you're dreaming while you're dreaming, and hopefully establish that you are dreaming. Of course, again, our critical faculties are not, um, are not running at 100% when we're dreaming. So sometimes we can miss cues, sometimes we can rationalize away things, um, and we won't notice we're dreaming. But still, we can improve our chances by doing reality testing. Also, if you see anything dreamlike during uh, your waking experience, you should ask yourself whether you're dreaming. You should test your state then. So uh, perhaps I encounter um, an environment that seems a lot like that weird dream house that I just described. Well, if I see something like that in real life, I might want to ask myself whether I'm dreaming. Or if I see a clown playing a saxophone, I might want to ask myself whether I'm dreaming. If I see anything at all dreamlike, I need to ask myself if I'm dreaming. And then hopefully that will occur when I actually am dreaming. Um, another thing you can do is make sure that you attempt to lucid dream during optimal times. So remember, um, REM periods get longer throughout the night. Um, so if you're going for a more focused lucid dreaming technique, you should try to do that after you've had a good night's sleep. Maybe if you usually sleep eight hours, um, get up after six or seven hours, spend a little bit of time up, up and about, and then go back to sleep for that last hour. You'll have your longest dream of the night during that time. And there are a couple of targeted techniques that you can use to try to enter directly um, into, into a dream. And I'll talk about some of those now. So the first of these targeted techniques was actually developed by Stephen LaBerge for his doctoral work. Uh, and you can actually read about it in more detail in um, Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming. And I'll actually make this chapter available in the video description. Um, I believe it's available on, um, on his website. Uh, and I'll, I'll provide a link for that. But um, it's called the mild technique or mnemonic induction of lucid dreams. And basically what it involves is um, sleeping for most of the night and waking up, hopefully, um, directly from REM sleep. So what you need to do once you've awakened from a dream and you still have an hour or so to sleep is stay up for a little bit and recall your dream. You can write it down. Um, you can just sit there and, and try to recall it as best you can. And then you want to go back to sleep. And what you want to do is... Um, Imagine yourself, as you're falling asleep, back in the dream, carrying out the same things that you were just doing. Imagine that you're having the same dream that you were just in. And, um, and tell yourself, as you're doing this, um, make, form the intention um, to remember to become lucid, to remember to notice that you're dreaming the next time you see something dreamlike, you know, like the sort of things you were just dreaming about. So if you're falling asleep, you're in bed, but maybe you've just had a dream that you're at the park. So you might tell yourself, okay, when I find myself back at the park, I'm going to remember that I'm actually having a dream. And remember the dream of, that you just had at the park. Try to picture yourself there and form this intention. And hopefully, you will end up in the same kind of place, or at least a similar place that you were just dreaming about. And that will hopefully... Um, trigger you to remember that you're actually trying to have a lucid dream. Uh, you can also pick another dream sign. Uh, so those, those dream-like things um, that I was talking about earlier that you want to identify by writing down your dreams. Some people call those dream signs. Um, you want to notice those cues. Um, uh, and you can, you can focus on those if, say, you've woken up and you want to go back to sleep for an hour during a longer REM period. Uh, if you don't remember a dream that you've just woken up from, you can imagine a different kind of dream. Um, and, and maybe imagine that you've encountered some dream signs of some kind and that you want to realize that you're dreaming uh, when you see one. So that's one technique. Another is uh, waking-induced lucid dreams. And here is where you try and fall asleep um, uh, with the intention to enter the dream directly by preserving some kind of awareness as you do it. There's a few different ways to do this. Um, one is to 
try and pay attention to what is called hypnagogic imagery. So hypnagogic imagery is uh, those weird geometrical figures, splotches of light, floaters and stuff that we sometimes see as we're falling asleep. What you can do is actually focus on that imagery and try to maintain your conscious awareness that way. Eventually, this hypnagogic imagery will give way to full-on REM sleep. In fact, hypnagogic means leading into sleep. So, uh, you can do this by trying to pay attention to hypnagogic imagery by, and, and at the same time keeping your intention to remain aware. Um, you know, carry that all into REM sleep. This is a little tricky to do. I, I at least find it a little tricky. So another thing that you can do is actually count yourself to sleep. And I've had dreams like, uh, like this where I'll, I'll count to sleep. You know, after sleeping for most of the night, I'll get up for a bit, remember my dream, and then I'll go back to bed and try to count like, one, I'm dreaming. Two, I'm dreaming. Three, I'm dreaming. You know, just count to yourself like this. And the next thing you know, you might find yourself in a dream uh, counting, you know, 45, I'm dreaming. Oh, wait, I really am dreaming. And, you know, you can do that. Um, and, of course, all of these techniques take practice. Um, and, um, you know, they're a cool way to explore consciousness and particular altered state of consciousness that is a, a lucid dream, which is, which is just really neat if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, so, um, that is all I have for today's lecture. As I said, it's fairly light. I've just kind of been riffing on some interesting things that I think are related to consciousness and things we can learn about consciousness by studying dreams. But I hope you enjoy this one. Um, our last two full lectures, which will be available within the next couple of days, will all be about artificial minds and the idea of artificial consciousness. So stay tuned for those two. I'll do one final quick lecture about how to study for the final exam, how to prep for the exam. In the meantime, I just want to say thanks again for bearing with me through all of this. I hope you're all still hanging in there. I hope you're all doing well. And I'll have more to say about your final exam uh, very shortly. Um, so stay tuned for those details and stay tuned for the next video lecture. And I will see you all next time.